Alison Scott, and uh, I work for the European Parliament, the office uh, here in London. Can you all hear me, and, and can you kind of vaguely see us from the back? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask the panellists shortly to introduce themselves and to speak a bit about their uh, own careers and their jobs that they do and how they're related to um, the EU, how they got there, what they do and what they enjoy and, and don't enjoy about their jobs. Um, whatever you do when you leave university here, and it's a jolly good start to, uh, to have a grounding and a degree from the UCL, we all know it's not going to be a walk in the park for you to get jobs. Hopefully you will um, within not too long a time after graduating. Probably you are not going to go into one career and stay there for the rest of your lives. Probably you're going to go different things. You're going to have career paths that take you into different fields uh, and that draw on different strengths that you will have built up both through your education, your extracurricular activities, and then the work experience that you end up gaining. Um, I would like to emphasize the importance of networking, especially in, um, in today's employment market. Letting people know that you're there, showing your strengths. It's not just about filling in um, application forms. It's not just about sending off CVs. If you've got a presence on, if you've got a blog, if you've got, if you're active on Twitter, if you've got a good profile on LinkedIn, um, you're a lot more likely to be noticed, not just by the institutions, but also by individuals in institutions who will then know who you are or be able to approach you or you'll find out about opportunities. They may also be informal opportunities that, that could arise for you. Um, Talking of networking and Twitter, we've got a, a Twitter wall here today. Um, our hashtag is EU Careers. We're going to take questions at the end. Uh, if you do want to put a question, um, we'll take them in the normal way, but if you want to tweet them as well, please do. Um, and we'll take questions after the panelists have, have spoken about what they do. So just briefly before we get there, I want to tell you about my own career. Um, I started off with a um, BA in European Studies with German from King's College London and LSE, so also uh, University of London. Uh, and I then went to work for the Financial Times using my languages, but realised that wasn't really what I wanted to be doing, and what I did want to be doing, I probably needed a master's degree for. So I went back to university, went to the University of Edinburgh, and I studied nationalism, which I thought was sort of quite a good counterbalance to European studies. Um, I then went on to work for the Scottish Government, uh, the Scottish Civil, Civic Forum. I got very interested in education, uh, and uh, also particularly education for citizenship, so encouraging people to engage with political processes. I worked for the Association for Citizenship Teaching uh, for six years, and I now work as the Education Project Manager for um, the European Parliament in, here in London. Um, so there are all sorts of careers that you can, that you can have within a European organisation or that relate to another European country or that work internationally. And the employment market for you at the moment it is international, and there are. Can I have a quick show of hands for how many people are hold a nationality that's not British in the room? Okay, put your hands down. Who is British in the room? About half and half? Yeah, probably. Um, so you might be going to your home country or one of your home countries, you might be looking for a job in the UK, you might find, be looking in the UK and find one somewhere else. I had a quick scour before I came um, of jobs that are available at the moment uh, in the European institutions and related uh, bodies. Uh, I looked quickly on eurobrussels.com and on europa.eu.epso which is the European Personnel Selection Office. 
Um, and here's, here are some of the jobs that are available right now. Press officer, credit risk expert, educational psychologist, air quality assessor, finance manager, lawyer, policy officer, research program officer, brackets, nuclear safety, and uh, MEP's assistant. So you can see that, that the breadth of things that are available to you uh, is, is enormous. You don't have to, like I did, study European studies. You don't have to be a languages graduate in order to get into this line of work. Languages are always helpful, um, especially if you're working internationally. It's always helpful to, to have uh, a couple of languages, uh, if not more. Um, and But there's, there's any any way that you can sort of get into things. And I think that what I've taken away from the people that I meet when, and hopefully you'll also hear from our panelists today, people have tended to pursue things that interest them. So people have tended to do a degree. You might discover at the end of your three or four years that it, it's not the most exciting thing after all. And actually, while you've been at university, you've been really involved in uh, drama society or in a something else society and, and that's actually just as or more interesting than your degree subject you might go off down that path and then later combine them and I think it's really important to pursue things that that really can interest you because that's what's going to give you a, a successful career success measured in terms of something that you enjoy so um, our panellists today are going to be talking about what they enjoy and what they don't enjoy, which should be interesting. We're going to start um, over here on the left. I'm going to allow the panellists to introduce uh, themselves and talk about what they do. So starting with Marley Morris. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks to the UCL European Institute for uh, inviting me to speak today. So am I, am I speaking loud enough? Can people hear at the back? If not, you can come forward. There are lots of spare chairs at the front. Check, check <laughs> Is that better? Okay, I can see some nodding, so that's a good sign. Great. Um, I thought what I'd do today is just briefly explain what I do uh, and the organisation I work for and what that is. I then go on to explain how I got to, to work for the organisation I work for. And then I just give a quick piece of advice from my... Um, couple of years uh, working so far. So I work for an organisation called Counterpoint. It's a research and advisory group. Um, I work as a researcher. And Counterpoint is uh, an organisation that uses social science tools to investigate how cultural and social dynamics underpin different forms of risks and opportunities. Um, so in practice that means looking at lots of different types of things including social movements and populism and extremism in particular. I work on a programme of work focusing in particular on populism and extremism across Europe. Um, so that's why it's relevant today uh, when I'm talking to you about this. Um, I look in particular at populism and xenophobia and at right-wing xenophobic populist parties. Uh, the project I work on mainly is called Europe's Reluctant Radicals. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I do uh, research including data analysis, including interviews, I write reports, articles, I give presentations on the analysis, and I uh, do workshops with civil society groups and with political groups. I also manage other projects. I'm managing a project on conspiracy theories at the moment, looking at France and Norway, um, liaising with partners and liaising with funders to get that to work. Organise events. I organised uh, an event uh, with the, U uh, the UCL European Institute here last year at the, about the French presidential elections. And I also developed the project further. So I look at things like how to get more funding, developing the corporate profile of CounterPoint and so on. So how did I get to CounterPoint? Well, I left university two years ago with a master's in maths and philosophy. So I didn't have a social science background at all. Um, after leaving university, I applied for a few different internships. I got an internship at the think tank Demos. And working there, I focused my time on a big project in the violence and extremism program, looking at populist parties across Europe, and in particular, looking at how supporters of these parties operate online, so on Facebook. 
that project was really interesting and really successful. And from there, I continued to work at Demos as a freelance researcher from time to time. So I did a project on aging across Europe, looking at four different European countries and looking at how the well-being of people over 65 uh, compares across those four different countries. I also, through CounterPoint, uh, met the direct, uh, through demo, sorry, I met the director of CounterPoint, so it was through a few uh, bits of networking there. And then I started working on the Reluctant Radicals project at CounterPoint. So I went straight from my internship at Demos to the job I have now. So my piece of advice uh, from my brief bit of experience so far is I think that the size of the organization really matters. And I think it's worth bearing that in mind when deciding what you want to do. Um, in particular, small organizations um, have benefits because you're able to shape them more. You have perhaps more autonomy, more independence. Uh, large organizations also have benefits because you perhaps have more training, more guidance, more opportunities for career progression. Um, but also, I think it's also important not just for choosing what to apply, but also how to apply. So looking at um, what different organizations, depending on their size, are going to be looking for. Small organizations are going to be particularly interested, for instance, in showing that you've got some independence, so you're interested in developing your own initiative and so on. And I think that's something that's particularly important. I mean, I think it's important across the board, but I think it's particularly important for small organizations that perhaps will need uh, or support more in a variety of different things. So I think my final remark was just that I think it's I think it's worth considering this kind of research and this kind of organisation, you know, think tanks as well as research groups as well as consultancies, when looking for work in European level or EU level. We do a lot of work at the European level, so um, I think it's a good good uh, alternative route in, and I think it's also good in terms of a stepping stone onto careers uh, at the EU or in the in the in the EU institutions. Thanks very much. Thank you. We'll take questions at the end and move straight on to John Evans. Yes, yes. Hi. Yeah, my name is John Evans. I work as a translator for the European Commission. Um, I can talk a bit about the different sort of jobs that there are for linguists in the EU institutions, but I, I'd say first of all that for any job working for the EU institutions, the European Commission, the European Parliament, the Council, for all those jobs, whether you're working as a lawyer, um, a nuclear inspector, an economist, a statistician, you have to have a foreign language. Um, and I think that's where British people tend to fall down. I think the UK is about 12% um, of the EU population, but we're less than 5% of the EU staff. Um, yeah, so the languages are important if you're working in Europe. Um, in terms of linguist jobs, we have three types of jobs. We have translators, interpreters, and lawyer linguists. The interpreters, obviously, are the people you see at uh, conferences, at meetings, in the booths, at the back of the room. Um, listening to a speech, maybe in German, and then giving the speech back in English. Uh, to work as an interpreter, you have to have a master's in conference interpreting, um, simply because you need that additional year of training to develop those skills. Lawyer linguists, um, they're people who have excellent language skills and then a legal qualification on top of that. So we have two types of lawyer linguists. Those working at the European Court of Justice are essentially translators. They're translating EU case law, judgments from national courts, and to do that they need uh, a legal qualification in addition to their language skills. And then we have lawyer linguists working at the European Parliament, at the Council, who are more involved in the drafting of legislation. And myself, I work as a translator. Um, there are around um, 4,500 translators working in all the various EU institutions. Um, each EU institution, or in, at least most of the big EU institutions, have their own translation services. At the European Commission, we're about 1,800 translators. We're divided into different language groups. So there's a, a Greek language department, a Swedish language department. In the English language department, we're about 120 translators. So we're, I think now we are the biggest language department. Um, what do we do? Well, we translate documents. We translate all kinds of documents, for the most part, that we receive from the member states. If you imagine <coughs> that all the member states are entitled to communicate with the EU institutions in their own language, so everything that the Polish government, for example, sends to the Commission, all its reports, legal queries, cases, complaints, uh, correspondence of any kind, arrives, uh, uh, arrives at the Commission in Polish. 
for most of the people working on those documents to understand them, they need to have them translated. So we work on translating those documents from all the different member states into English. For that reason, we have to try and cover all um, the different EU official languages. Which uh, leads me to one of the, the good things about the job is the, the um, opportunity to learn a new language. So obviously we need people who have a knowledge of languages as well as French, German, Spanish, Italian, the most commonly taught ones in the UK. We need people with a knowledge of Lithuanian, of Slovene, of Slovak, of Latvian. Um, it's quite difficult to find uh, English native speakers with a knowledge of those languages, so we provide training for our translators to learn those languages. So in my case, when I uh, joined the commission, I was given the choice of learning either um, Slovak, Hungarian, Latvian, or Polish. Um, quite a tempting offer there. Um, and I chose to learn Polish. I had some Polish friends. I knew Poland was the biggest of the, of the new countries that had recently joined the EU. And um, I knew that in my unit we didn't have many people with Polish, so I knew I'd ha I, I would have a lot of work from it. So I had Polish classes at work, so four hours a week during work time, so one morning or one afternoon a week. I also had the opportunity to go to Poland for language classes, so I did a month in uh, Krakow on a, a summer program at the university there. I later did um, four weeks of four hours a day of one-to-one -one Polish tuition in a small language school in Warsaw. So it was quite intensive, or very intensive, I, su I should say. Um, you know, every day you're doing four hours a day with one teacher, with two teachers. You go home, you have homework to do, you go to the shop, you go to a restaurant, it's all in Polish. So it's um, very intensive, but it's by being in the country that you, you learn a lot. Obviously, when you start translating, you don't start with very long, complicated documents. So I'd start translate, when I started translating Polish, I would be doing, you know, a letter from a Polish ministry that might be one paragraph. It might take me the best part of an afternoon to translate one paragraph. But you have the opportunity to go and speak to colleagues in the Polish department to ask them you know, if you're having problems. My work would be revised by senior translators who have a much better knowledge of Polish than me. So it's a learning um, experience as well. Um, so my own background, then, I have a degree in French and Spanish from Cardiff University. Uh, when I graduated, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, so I went back to Spain and taught English for a year in Barcelona. Um, then. I sort of had a more serious think about what I wanted to do and decided that I wanted a job where I used my languages and where languages were the focus of my job. So I didn't want a job where occasionally I would get to use my languages. I wanted to do a job where the main focus of the job was languages. So I went back, um, I came back to the UK and I did a postgraduate diploma in translating and interpreting at Bath University. Um, I went pretty much from there to working as a linguist in the British Civil Service for a couple of years. I then worked for um, a UN agency in Switzerland for um, about two and a half years, and then I've been at the Commission um, about eight years. Um, I think another thing that I like about the job is, um, I think like any big organization, there are lots of opportunities there for you. If you want to stay in translation, you can carry on in translation, you can move up the, the ladder, you know, staying in translation. If you want to go out and do different things, you can. So I worked for six years in translation. For the past two years, I've been working still for the translation service, but in the commission's office in London, um, where my role is quite different. I um, go to universities to talk about careers in translating and interpreting. I work with um, schools and uh, languages teachers associations to try and encourage more young people to learn languages. I organize events um, in London related to languages as well. So it's quite a, a varied role now. Um, in terms of uh, recruitment then, we recruit annually for linguists, for translators, loyal linguist interpreters. Um, but each year we look for different languages. So for example, this summer we'll be looking for translators of uh, oh, translators working into English, French, Italian, Maltese, Dutch, Slovene, Danish, Hungarian. Interpreters working into English, French, Romanian, Slovene. Loyal linguists working uh, into German, Latvian, Dutch, Portuguese, Danish, German, English, Irish, and, and um, yeah, and English and Irish. So that's quite a wide range of um, languages. Um, the recruitment procedure, it's quite a long process. It takes about nine months. That may seem like a long process. It's actually much faster than it used to be. When I did the whole recruitment procedure under the old system, it took twice as long. So 
perfectly thankful that it's only nine months and not 18. Um, you have to go um, and you apply online in the summer, then you have to do some computer-based tests, so verbal, abstract, numerical reasoning. Um, you have to do well in these tests in order to go through to the next stage, which is an assessment centre. So it's normally the top 8, 12, 15%, 5%, depending on how many people apply. Um, the assessment centre, you do some translation tests um, or interpreting tests. Um, uh, also a group exercise, um, uh, oral presentation and an interview. You have to do the assessment centre in, if English is your first language, at the moment you have to do that assessment centre in French or German. That might change, it might be another language, but you have to do it in a foreign language. Um, they're not looking at how well you speak the language, you know, they're not saying, oh, your grammar isn't very good, your pronunciation is weak, it's what you say. So they're looking at competency. So it's things like prioritising and organising, working with other people, delivering results, those kinds of things that most graduate employers are looking for. Um, so it's just giving examples, you know, what evidence do you have, you know, that you can do, the, that you have these skills. Um, yes, and no, if you go to the assessment centre, normally you have a sort of one in three chance then of being successful. Those who are successful are placed on a reserve list of all the successful candidates, and then the different institutions take people off that reserve list to fill vacancies. Um, yeah, so I think that's about everything. Um, in terms of, I know I said what I liked was, you know, it's... Um, one of the things was working as a linguist, um, the opportunity to learn new languages. It's a, an international environment. You're working with people from all across the EU. It's the European Commission. It's a big bureaucracy. I worked in the British Civil Service for a UN agency. It's a, all those are big bureaucracies. So the disadvantages that come with that. Sometimes you know, things can take a while. Um, in a small organization, as uh, Marley was saying, you know, you've got more chance sometimes to, to develop your own um, and use your own initiative a bit more, maybe. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. So, um, most of you are confronted on an everyday basis with representatives of my species. So, I'm an academic, I'm in house, I work here at UCL, and I direct the master's program on European public policy. So, I research on the EU, I teach on the EU, and I organize all sorts of events around the EU. Um, what I'm going to talk about <clears throat> a little more broadly is research careers, <coughs> EU-related research careers. So what I'm talking about probably applies less to you if you want to be a, a mover and shaker. It applies more to people, I think, who like to stay a bit at the sidelines, who like to observe, who like to analyze, who like to theorize, um, and who like to write. So I think these are key aspects of what you would be doing. Uh, if you were do, ha having a career in, um, in research. I'm going to talk uh, about two possible research um, careers. One would be think tanks, um, but I'm a lot less qualified uh, to talk about that. I think Marley might be able to answer some um, questions on that um, from what I hear. And then um, a career in academia, if, uh, any, if anyone is looking um, for this. So I'm going to talk about what do you do uh, in both areas? <clears throat> what do I like about my job? What do I dislike? Um, and what quali qualities do you need to bring um, to become an academic, um, basically? So there are two things you can do. So you can work in think tanks, um, the like of Marley mentioned Demos here in London, um, the Centre for European Reform um, here in London, think tanks such as the Centre for European Policy Studies, um, CEPs in Brussels, the Social and Economic Observatory in Brussels. There are quite a few um, around. I think what you do if you work in a think tank is you mainly analyse um, current, um, current policy-related events. You report, you inform, and ideally, um, you try to advise and influence decision makers. Um, from what I know about um, friends of mine working in think tanks, you're also very much involved in organizing events, um, in networking, um, in running workshops, and you probably would spend quite a bit of time in raising funds to actually secure the future of your job. Um, so I think th think tanks are not usually the most stable um, of, of work opportunities from what I gather. If you think about think tank opportunities, they, they work very differently. Some are very research focused, some are very events focused. So um, have a, if, if this is a career that interests you, be quite um, specific about what you would like to do. So for instance, there is the Federal Trust here in London, very active in the debate, but mainly organizing events. There's the Center for European Reform, very much focused on research and publishing reports. So um, 
academia, I guess you all have a bit of a feel of what it's like uh, to be an academic. As I say, you're confronted with us um, a lot. Um, I would say we do four things. We do research, we do teaching, we do admin, and we do our own form of fundri fundraising, uh, which is called a grant application. So finding money uh, to finance your research, which can be costly. In terms of <coughs> research, just to give you an example, um, I'm currently doing a project um, on the European Parliament and the question why uh, decision making is taking place in the informal arena. Uh, research on that would um, Im include finding a theory that fits, um, putting together a data set which you can work with, doing interviews in Brussels, analyzing documents, and obviously writing papers on the subject, going to conferences, working with people um, who work on similar, on similar issues. Um, teaching, as an, as an academic, you, you almost always teach. Um, in most uh, places you can teach on, on um, questions that interest you, um, and you offer courses usually both at graduate and at undergraduate level. We do quite a bit of admin in the background. Um, there are lots of committees, there are things to organize. Tomorrow, for instance, our department has an open day, so we are all there selling our programs and, and answering um, questions. Um, I do a study trip to Brussels, for example, with, with my students. So we do quite a bit of admin. Um, and as I said, writing grant applications um, is an increasingly important part of our jobs. Again, um, as I said, with uh, think tanks, think very clearly about what they, what they do, whether they're more events or more research oriented. If you're thinking about academia, both if you want to do a PhD and more long term, look at very carefully at the departments and what they do and how they study the EU whether they study the EU in relation with public policy, external relations, whether they are very, very political science-y, um, as is our department, or more sort of cultural um, humanities oriented as are, <clears throat> as are others. What do I like um, and hate about, well, not hate, <laughs> what do I like and not like about the job? Um, I love the intellectual challenge. It's really a job. You will never be bored in that job because it's so varied. As I said, you, you do all these, um, these different things. You have the freedom, you have an, probably Nowhere else do you have so much freedom to work on what interests you and to shape your own, uh, and to shape your own job according to your own initiative. Um, so from re from research over teaching to supervising PhD students, you do very different things, and all of them, most of them, are really intellectually stimulating. I'm still excited about the questions I explore ever more so, I think, in my research. So it is it is hugely interesting. There are a couple of things um, which are challenging, I think, particularly about an academic job. Um, I've never worked anywhere else than in academia, so that maybe they are similar to challenges uh, my colleagues are facing. Um, you are under a lot of pressure, I think, in most jobs you are. Um, your career and your reputation depends exclusively on your research, um, yet you have a lot of competing demands on your time. So sometimes you feel what you're being judged on is quite difficult to actually do <laughs> on a normal working day. It's very difficult to draw a line between your private life and your professional life in terms of it's very, it's quite, you know your students, you're researching, it's very difficult to stop thinking about your research. The concept of a weekend, yes, that exists, but <laughs> doesn't always <laughs> get realized because even when you leave the office, you keep research, or you can keep researching. And it can be quite isolated, especially when you're writing your PhD. It can be a very, very lonely experience. Why is everyone laughing? It's true, it's yourself and your project <laughs> and your supervisor. Um, okay, so how do you get uh, to these kinds of jobs? So um, think tanks, from what I understand, you really need expertise, you need to be able to write well, you need to have great analytical and communication skills and the route, and I think um, Mali was, um, was talking about that, the route usually is an internship, um, very competitive, I think, to get into think tanks. If you want to go into academia, you have to first and foremost be a very good researcher. And the way that is being measured is whether you can publish or not, and whether you can publish in good journals or not. This is the standard of assessment in our in our discipline and in our in our profession. You have to be a, a good communicator, and I think you need three ski, uh, three key skills: self-discipline, because you have to be self-motivated. I guess you all know this <laughs> from your current life. You have to have a lot of self-confidence because. You have to publish, but it's not always very straightforward to get into very good journals, uh, which is, again, the benchmark for assessment. And you have to have patience, because sometimes you have to do a lot of research and you have to spend a lot of time on a project and you, until you see the results, both in terms of actual results and then the results going out into the public uh, arena. So you do need, you need quite a bit of patience. 
what you need as an academic is a PhD. I think the, the times where, where people could have academic careers without a PhD are definitely over. And in order to get a PhD placed at a good university, you need a master's degree. You need a master's degree in, a high, in the high 60s or you need a first. You need a really good idea about what to write on, and you need to find someone who's convinced that this is a good idea and who's willing to be your supervisor. Probably you also need funding, and that is really not very easy to, to get um, either in the UK or in a lot of other European countries. If you then want to get a job, you need publications and you need some teaching experience, but the key if you go, if, you, if you're planning to do a PhD in view of an academic career, then publications and getting yourself known um, in, in, in your academic community by going to conferences, getting papers out there, getting your ideas out is crucial. Um, I did my own PhD at the European University Institute in Florence, and if you have any questions about, about the EUI, or if you have questions about um, doing a PhD in the UK, I'm very happy to answer them. Um, Alex, where are you? Uh, is Alex around? Alex is organizing this event. He's uh, maybe <laughs> disappeared, but I'm sure he's going to come back uh, for the drinks. Alex is a PhD student uh, in our department, working working with uh, Professor David Cohen and myself. So he can talk uh, talk a bit more about what it's like to be a PhD uh, student. Thank you very much. I'm going to try not to talk too much about the fast stream because it's only relevant to half of you and talk more about EU careers in general, but just a little bit on the fast stream first. Um, so as you said, I'm a European fast streamer. So um, you become one of those by ticking a box on the fast stream application process. Um, and then you end up where I am now. Um, there are about 15 of us every year. Um, across various departments. So there's three of us in FCO this year. Um, there are three in the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, um, three at DEFRA, and sort of various others scattered around. Um, what sort of sets us apart from the um, mainstream, far stream, is that the aim of our, our far stream contract, our two years in the far stream, is to uh, work for a European institution by the end of the process. Um, so we get language training, um, we get training to take the uh, Concours exam, which we've sort of already touched on, but I will um, I'll return to in a second. Um, and the idea is that after your after your two years um, and two attempts at taking the uh, EU careers entrance exams, um, you will have got a job in the in the EU institution, um, and then you will uh, leave the UK civil service and go and work um, for the EU. Um, so why does the British government do that? Why do, we, um, why do we train people for two years only to see them go off and work somewhere else? Um, now, the reason for this has been touched on already, but um, just to reiterate, we are 12.6 odd percent of the EU population, um, but we only make up less than 5% of uh, EU staff, and that is a declining figure. We're not sort of you know, stable, lots of people are... Um, retiring that joined um, when we uh, joined the EU in the 70s. Um, so we're very, very keen to get people um, you know, into the EU institution. So uh, if I can take anything away, if you take anything away from this, it's uh, please do think about pursuing an EU job because if you do, it will help my job immensely. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be excellent for my, um, my sort of you know, statistics and things. That would be great. Um, so EU careers more broadly, so this has already been touched on, so I don't want to dwell on this too much, um, but um, every year the EU holds a uh, concours, a competition for people to enter as a generalist um, to the uh, European institutions. Now, this is very much so like the fast stream application process. Um, so you have initial computer-based testing to sort of test your... Um, verbal reasoning skills and uh, other skills, and then you have an assessment center where you do, as was, uh, as was said, sort of group exercises and uh, other sort of you know, competency-based um, testing. Um, the slight problem is that there isn't a concours this year for you to apply for. Um, the reasons for that are um, fairly boring and legal, um, but the upshot is that if you do want to apply for a uh, sort of general graduate stream uh, entry to the European Commission, you will unfortunately need to wait until 2014. But don't worry, um, there's plenty that you can be doing in the meantime. Um, so 
whilst you wait for this sort of graduate scheme to reopen to you all, um, there are other opportunities. So you can be a, a stagiaire, you can be an intern at the European Commission, a blue book stagiaire. Um, these are five-month uh, internships at the uh, European institutions in, uh, in Brussels, although sometimes they might be um, at other institutions as well. Um, they are fantastic. They really are. They're five months of getting a really good look at how Europe works. Um, and it's not just um, sort of you know, useful for um, sort of the kind of EU careers that I'm talking about, but for anything. Um, so uh, before joining the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, I worked in financial services for three years, and we would snap up people that had done um, a stage, done an internship in one of the European institutions, because it gives you a really unique insight into uh, how the institutions work. You build excellent contacts. We've already touched on how uh, how important networking is. Um, so I really would emphasise that these are great, great things to do, um, and because it's you. Know, the, the sort of general, rather like the UK fast stream, the uh, you know, European Union's uh, Concord exams, they are a commitment. You know, it does take a long time to apply for them. Um, you know, it is a full-term career. So if you're not sort of necessarily ready to make that kind of commitment, um, then I'd suggest a, uh, uh, a stage and internship is really an excellent way to um, go about it. Um, again, it's always already been touched on. Um, one of the key things about um, working for one of the European institutions, working for the EU, is that you have a language requirement. Um, now, obviously, for a translator, this is somewhat of a higher bar <laughs> than uh, um, people like myself. Um, and my sense is, in sort of you know, looking at this issue and talking to people about this, is that a lot of people worry about the language requirement and think, well, if I don't speak fluent French or fluent German, um, I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, you don't need to be fluent. You, know, you need to have a good understanding of the language. You need to be able to bring, your, you know, bring across a point in a group exercise. You need to be able to make yourself understood. But you know, no one's going to ask you to start translating you know, Proust or anything like that. It's, it's not that complicated. So if you do, I mean, you know, and from a personal perspective, you know, I did an A-level in French you know, a fair few years ago, um, and I haven't used it particularly regularly since. Um, and I'm going to be fine. You know, I get language tuition, but I'm, you know, I'm not worried about the language aspect of things. So if you do have you know, sort of a background in French or German, but you think it's a bit rusty and you're worried that it might not be up to scratch for um, a European job, don't. You know, it, it's not really a big impediment, um, and it's not um, something that you can't uh, sort of bring up, to, bring up to scratch quite quickly. Um, I might just leave it there because uh, I feel that if, uh, if you guys have more specific questions on you know, how to apply for EU careers or about the European Fast Stream or the UK Civil Service Fast Stream, um, I'm more than happy to answer them, but I'll let you sort of come forward with those kind of questions. Just, uh, just before we move on to our last speaker, um, who's Elise Graham, uh, we Please do start thinking about uh, your questions. Uh, the hashtag, again, if you want to tweet them, is EU careers. Um, so either ask them afterwards or, or, or tweet them straight over here. Um, and Elise. Thank you very much. Um, so my name's Elise, and I work as a researcher for a shadow um, minister in the House of Commons, I'm a shadow minister for international development. I'm actually filling in for my colleagues who unfortunately couldn't make it today, and he actually has years of experience working for the European Parliament. So he's passed me a few notes, and so I thought I'd do is um, talk to you a bit about how you can get experience working in the EP, and then talk to you a bit more about what I do um, at the UK Parliament, and what the opportunities are um, working in the House of Commons if you actually have an interest in the EU. Um, so one of the best ways to experience working um, in the EP is to start working um, in an MEP's office. I know that's what my colleague did. He started working for Claude Moray's MEP, and that's actually also what I did um, interning in an MP's office. Even if you can just spare one or two days um, a week, I know that you know, doing an unpaid internship isn't very financially sustainable for a long time, so just a couple days will be enough to at least get you that first experience, which will get you noticed. Um, for the European Parliament, it's really important. I mean, this has already been said, but you have to perfect your language skills. You need to be learning at least French or German or Italian or Spanish. And I know that there's obviously interest for other rarer languages as well. Um, it's also really important that you need to identify 
identify and develop areas of expertise in any research brief um, that you're doing, and you need to become very consultable. And finally, this has already been said by Millicent, but we're just going to reiterate it. It's really important that you network. You need to network and build on your contact um, bases because meeting people is really going to be the, the way you're going to get your future job. You need to meet as many people as you can in the industry you're interested in. I want to talk a bit now about the UK Parliament, which I'm much more familiar with. Um, as a researcher for a Shadow Minister for International Development, I lead on all the international development work in my office. Um, that involves a wide range of responsibilities, from drafting speeches, drafting parliamentary questions, articles, preparing my member for debates in the chamber, um, preparing her for media interviews, and um, probably what's most exciting is helping um, draft policy recommendations uh, and policy reviews for 2015, which is when the next general election will be. If you're interested in politics, the House of Commons is an excellent place to work. Um, not only do you have, you're working in an incredible building, but you also have access to you know, a vast number of very, very interesting people. It's very fast paced. And so I would definitely encourage you to um, apply for a post there. Um, you're also given a lot of responsibility fairly early on, especially if you're working for a front bencher in opposition, because the nature of parliament is that you have, very small, you have a very small number of members of staff, and so you have to do a lot of work. Um, I would say that the main perks in my job is overseas travel, because um, our brief is international development. I'm lucky enough that I'm going to Burma and Lebanon in the next couple few months which is always very exciting, and you get to see lots of first-hand um, experience work. But if you're really interested in working um, in the EU and the European institutions, there, is, there are actually ways in which you can combine that interest with working in Parliament. Um, I mean, depending on what your party affiliation is, you could try working in the office of David Lington. He's our, shadow, he's our minister for Europe, sorry. Or you could work for Emma Reynolds. She's our shadow minister. There are, of course, the, you know, the offices of, of William Hague and, and Douglas Alexander. They have overall responsibility for the department. Um, these are obviously very co coveted vacancies, and um, you know, the posts don't always come up very regularly, but they do recruit interns, and it is always a good thing to apply. Um, another option is also getting experience working for a peer in the House of Lords. Uh, Baroness Vazi is the minister um, for the FCO, and her brief covers, it covers Europe. We also have a Lords um, spokesperson for Labour um, in the House of Lords. There are also other ways of working um, in Parliament within uh, EU-related uh, capacity. Um, for instance, we have an EU Select Committee in the House of Lords, and um, that Select Committee considers EU documents and other EU-related matters in advance of decisions being made, um, and they do this to influence the government's position on negotiations in Brussels, and they try to hold them to account um, on their actions at an EU level. The committee has cross-party membership, so whether you're Conservative, Labour, Lib Dem, cross-venture, um, you'll find um, sort of a, a lord who, or a baroness who may share your interests. Um, there are about 20 of them, so it's really worth actually sort of doing a bit of research and seeing who might, who might um, want to hire you or at least um, give you a bit of work experience. That EU um, subcommittee, the EU select committee actually has six subcommittees, and I'm not going to bore you with all the details of that, but that's just to explain that there are actually a lot of lords who work on EU-related matters in um, the House of Lords. It's also worth looking at um, all party groups. These are um, informal cross-party groups run by members of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And I think there are about five or six um, all-party groups that are EU-related. So there are lots of opportunities to do that. Um, getting some experience in the UK Parliament is largely the same um, to getting experience um, in the European Parliament. Um, there's a website that publishes vacancies for, um, uh, vacancies for working for an MP, and it's actually very explicit. It's called um, the Work for an MP website. I can give you the actual URL if you're interested. Um, it, when you're looking for this type of work, it's really important that um, you decide what your interests are, what your party affiliation is, and that you make that very clear from the start. It's also worth contacting your local MP 
figuring out whether or not they have the same party affiliation as you and contacting them for some informal work experience because MPs always do tend to try to want to help their constituents. If you volunteer in Westminster also, you'll start learning quickly a parliamentary process and parliamentary procedure, and that's really important if you want to work in, in Parliament, and that should stand you in good stead to getting a permanent position. Um, when you're obviously going for an interview for these kind of things, it's really important you prepare really well and that you know the member, whether it's an MP or a peer, off by heart, what their constituency is, you have to know their brief very well, and um, I would say also go on, on websites such as Hansard or the They Work For You website and read their past speeches, learn what their, their passions are, and, and contact them that way. Um, and obviously you need to demonstrate sympathy with the aims of the party um, that mm -hmm. particular MP or peer represents. So there we go, hope that was helpful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much indeed to all our panellists. It's quite a, within quite a narrow field of working for um, the EU and European institutions, um, quite a broad spectrum of uh, experiences. I'd say the themes that have came through from pretty much everyone um, were the importance of getting experience, which is really difficult when you're a, a student, um, because your experience is in being at university and, and, and being a student. But there are some very good ideas for how to get sort of first step in, first step on the ladder. Um, events and, and networking and the importance of doing that also online, even if you can't go and meet people face to face. Uh, and, and also languages. I think everyone mentioned languages um, and how important they are. They can also improve. If you, if you find yourself going to live in Poland for a few years, your Polish skills will be a darn sight better by the time you've left there than they were when you started. So if you just have the basics, then it, there's always room to, room to improve. Um, and I just also wanted to add one career choice that we haven't mentioned. We've talked a lot about um, being an MP's researcher. Uh, and being an MEP, a member of the European Parliament, but not about those as actual career choices. So I just thought I'd add on, sort of talking about those, either in the UK or in, um, or in whichever country you're from. And again, for, um, for diplomacy, uh, although you might not be joining the, the British civil service, the British um, uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, you might well be joining a graduate scheme in, in your own country or looking into um, becoming uh, an ambassador or a diplomat uh, for your own country. And I'm sure you know, you know how to find those things out. Um, a lot of the MEPs and MPs uh, started life in completely different career paths. We have an awful lot of ex-teachers, ex-lawyers, uh, ex-nurses who are in, uh, in Parliament, both the UK and the European Parliament. We also have a lot of people who started off as researchers, um, who got involved with the party, um, who became engaged in how parliaments work and what sort of work there is and um, to go um, and who go down that route. So although not that many people set off thinking, right, I'm going to be a member of the European Parliament, a lot of the sorts of careers that we've heard people talking about here are the sorts of things that might lead you in that direction in 10, 15, 20 years' time. So, thanks very much again. Can we take some uh, questions from you? The so three questions um, were... Uh, First one about working for people who are not in their final year uh, and what options are available to them, for example, summer internships. Uh, the second one was elaborating a little bit more on uh, the advantages and disadvantages of working in smaller and larger organisations. And the third one was on um, people who've got PhDs but who've not gone down the, the academic route and what other options are there available to them. So, um, who wants to take the first one of... Uh, ideas and opportunities for people who are not yet in their final year. Um, I can I can start. Yeah. Then. Um, yeah. Yeah. So all the EU institutions run traineeships for graduates, but there um, are some limited limited opportunities for uh, undergraduates. 
um, at different institutions. It tends to be things, um, uh, the institutions or the policy areas in those institutions related to those areas. So I don't know the um, website off the top of my head, but if you Google something like student traineeships EU institutions, you should get to it. And if not, I can send um, um, the EU careers, uh, the EU uh, Institute UCL, the link to it. Because there are some, but generally it's for graduates, but there are some limited student traineeship opportunities there. Okay. Thank you. I also wanted to add to that that uh, it is so important to get some kind of experience because when you do graduate and you come into, come around to filling in those forms that say, what's your experience? And you kind of go, well, pulled some pints last summer, it's not, it's often not going to help you. But you've got to balance that also with uh, making some money usually over the summer to, to try and uh, make ends meet through the, the next year. Um, getting experience is, is really important. Again, networking, getting your, your CV up there, going on sites like LinkedIn and so that you can tell people quite easily, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I do. Um, and asking people, possibly putting it on Twitter, uh, and asking people if there's something you can do. Political parties often need um, researchers. There's often things that you can do over the summer. Um, so perhaps not the formal graduate training programs, but something that is going to show that you have interest, uh, that you are able to work, that you have been able to just basic things like showing up in the morning and staying through till the end of the day, it's good to be able to show that to a prospective employer uh, and to, to be able to talk about in interviews when you have graduated, talk about your work experiences and what you've learned from those because it is a whole new world out there of work and showing that you have some kind of understanding of it can be really helpful when you're going to, to interviews. Um, so I would say go through the informal ways rather than the graduate training programs uh, during the summer holidays. Anyone else want to say something about that? Yeah. Um, just very quickly, what I would say is that in my office and in a number of other offices in the Commons, um, we take on undergraduates for just a, a couple, one or two days a week. So they kind of mould it around their timetable at university, and they come in um, at Westminster or in the constituency office, and they do just a bit of work. And it's very flexible because we understand that you're still studying. Um, so that's also an option. So cold calling is always good. Uh, and then the question about uh, small and, and large organisations. Shall we? Um, yes, thanks for that. Yeah, the question um, about the size of the organisation. I think, as I said before, I think small organisations you get to have a real impact um, on the direction of, of of them. I think you, know, you get a real opportunity to shape how how they are and. You know, and, and I mean, depending on how the organisation is structured, but certainly for my organisation, that's a real plus because it means that I have quite a lot of autonomy. I can decide what what kinds of projects I want to work on next. I can develop my own funding, uh, f uh, funding strategies, and so on. Also, you get a lot of responsibilities, so opportunities to to do more uh, kind of. Uh, traveling or, or speaking or opportunities to do to do more kind of report writing more independent work um, and also I think working in a small organization kind of gives you opportunities to meet other organizations as well because often you have to work beyond your organization because it's so small so you get opportunities to kind of meet other organizations and see and see how they work as well which is kind of interesting I think a disadvantage I guess is that well sometimes the responsibility can work both ways and that it's it's actually a bit scary and can be a bit difficult because often you don't have guidance but you, you're not sure exactly how things work because you don't have that kind of big kind of institution to kind of fall back on so that's maybe a disadvantage. Um, just on the uh, internship point I think with think tanks some some uh, think tanks uh, for instance Demos did did uh, take on I think undergraduates occasionally often though they it's a bit of a catch-22 because they wanted people from uh, who had graduated already, so it is difficult. I mean, I, I personally hadn't, hadn't had a summer internship, but I did get an internship um, once finished, once graduating, uh, straight away afterwards. So it's not the end of the world, I think, if you don't have that summer internship. Thank you. Um, question on PhDs. PhDs. So PhDs leading <coughs> took 
career which is not in academia. So um, three of um, three people I know from Florence actually ended up not in academia. Everyone else actually does have academic jobs. One works um, in the Council of Ministers now, or now in the European External Action Service in, in um, a very interesting position. One works as the lead campaigner for EU Electric, which is a it's a EU electricity companies um, organization, and one works for the ECB. Um, I think Florence, if anyone thinking about doing a PhD but not going into research, the European University Institute is interesting, not only because you have a funded opportunity to do your PhD, but because there are direct links to the European Commission, so you can do the stage that um, Ben was talking about um, as part of, of doing your PhD. Whether it's work, I don't know what's sort of behind your question, but if you're thinking about whether it's worth doing a PhD without wanting to go into academia, I think that very much depends on the system you want to you want to go to. Um, if you want to work in Germany or Austria, yes, definitely, by all means, do a PhD because most people in, in a lot of people in leading positions have PhDs. I think if you want to stay in the UK, it's probably safe to say that it's probably not at all required or might even, I don't know if it might work to your disadvantage, but I would definitely not recommend it. It really depends. It also depends on where you do it. It's a huge investment in time. You delay starting your job um, by three, four years if you don't want to go into academia. So it's something you should probably only embark on if you're absolutely sure. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we've also had a question for George from um, Twitter. But I just want to say I, I'm now working for the European Parliament. The last organization I worked for, there were three of us. So I, that's a huge difference from a small and, and you know, large organization. Um, my experience, my personal experience, is that things were a lot easier um, to get done because you just had to get the agreement of two people. They knew you, they worked with you every day, and you could kind of say, yeah, this is a good idea, isn't it? Um, and sort of twist their arm until they agreed with you. Working for an enormous bureaucratic international institution such as the European Parliament is considerably um, different to that. Um, it does mean um, that you have a lot more support. So I did often feel when I was working in an organisation with three people that, well, I thought it was a good idea, but I wasn't quite sure. Things like when we had legal questions, are we legally allowed to do this? Uh, contracting someone else to do work? And I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal specialist, but I was the one writing the contracts because there wasn't really anyone else. Um, and, and those sorts of things. I've got a lot of experience doing a lot of, sort of very diverse things, like writing contracts, which I'm actually not particularly interested in, but, you know, hey, I can do it now. Um, and obviously working for, for a larger organization, there's a whole team of lawyers who, who, who do that sort of thing, and you don't need to take up your time doing that sort of thing if that's not the main point of the, the contract that you're trying to, to get someone to sign. So um, there's, there's a big difference big difference there as well. Any more questions? Thank you. I'm just going to repeat them again for the, for the recording. Um, so the first one was um, to do a PhD, uh, do you need to do a master's first? Um, the second one was uh, do MPs offer internships to uh, non-UK nationals? Um, Jobs in Brussels, what's still open, uh, what's still available, seeing as there isn't a concours and uh, the stagiaires' uh, applications have closed. Um, then we had one on graduate schemes. What experience in particular are they looking for, uh, if any? Uh, and one question on, other than the fast stream, uh, what, what routes are there into the, the Foreign Office? Uh, and finally, um, it was said earlier that um, assessments are in French or German. Is it just those two languages? Uh, and what other languages um, could be useful? So do you want to um, to start with just the, the final question there about the, the languages? Yeah, at, oh, at the moment, um, you do have to have uh, French or German as your foreign language for the assessment centre. That might change, though, so keep an eye on the EU careers website for that. But at the moment, you do have to have French or German. Also, um, once you do start working in the institutions, your first promotion, in order to get your first promotion, you have to uh, reach uh, a certain level in a second foreign language as well. So that's the sort of importance that we place on languages. Um, I'll just mention um, the question about the traineeships. Um, 
the commission traineeship is probably the most well known. It's for that reason, it's also the most competitive. It's worth looking at all the different EU institutions. Most of them run their own traineeship schemes, the smaller institutions, also all the um, EU agencies. For example, in London, you have the European Medicines Agency. They have a traineeship scheme. In Poland, you'll have uh, Frontex Border Control. So there's all these different EU agencies all around the EU um, that run traineeships. So it's worth looking into that. And um, related to that, also in terms of experience, is to demonstrate an interest in uh, the agency, the institution, the policy area that you're applying for as well. That's always important. So they're looking for people who have an interest, who can show an interest in it as well. Thank you. Uh, and then we had um, a question about, um, do you need a master's to do a PhD? Mm -hmm. Uh, just following uh, up quickly on the on the previous speaker, um, several um, students from the from the master's program I directed last year they also didn't do the blue book stage, um, but did stage in the European Parliament or with the Committee of the Regions or um, with e uh, with ECOSOC. So and they did apply later and the stages were paid and some of them are now working in more permanent positions in Brussels. So absolutely, just to just to reiterate that, uh, yes, you do need a master's and you need a. Um, a degree in the high 60s or first um, to do a PhD. At least that's the requirement at UCL. And do uh, MPs offer places to learn UK? <laughs> I've had American, Canadian, and Australian colleagues um, in my office, so the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, just as long as you demonstrate, uh, you know, a clear understanding and interest in, in UK politics mainly echo that and just say that the FCO does also um, offer um, an internship uh, scheme, which I think we're continuing with. I'm not sure. We have to find out. Well, we have to find out. But um, that's another sort of option. Um, and I work with um, sort of a couple of the people that are doing that scheme at the moment. Um, and I mean, they're excellent, incredibly qualified people, but they get to do a lot of, you know, a lot of really interesting, really quite cool stuff. Um, so. Um, I will have to check with you whether we're going to do that again um, because I think it's a very new scheme. But um, if it's uh, if it's not, um, I would encourage that very much. It's um, it's a great um, scheme. Um, now that I've got the mic, I might just very quickly try to answer a couple of your questions as well. Um, so um, other routes into the EU institutions, um, it's already kind of been covered off, but um, do look at the various agencies um, for their traineeships. I mean, I know. Um, it's again quite specific, but the Court of Justice, Courts of Justice, do a sort of traineeship program for um, for lawyers, and it's just worth going to all the websites and just you know, or googling the agency itself and traineeship and just sort of seeing what comes up. Um, in terms of what experience, sort of on the grad schemes, the um, uh, either the institutions or the UK civil service are looking for, um, I don't want to put you guys off getting extra sort of experience either through internships or things like that, but both the UK Civil Service Fast Stream and the EU Concours um, application process don't look at things like that. Once you've actually got to the start line of applying for it and you 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 you're you're into the into the game and doing the computer-based tests and the assessment centres, it it doesn't look at things like that. It's all competency-based. So it's how you operate in these circumstances. Now that's not to say that having um, good work experience doesn't help you because um, part of the um, assessment is um, for both civil service and for the um, European institutions is um, an interview where it's really helpful to be able to draw on um, work experience to explain, you know, demonstrating an example, a situation where you showed leadership. It's quite useful to be able to draw on uh, um, a job and it just helps you generally um, to you know, have, uh, have done work experience. But in terms of what do they actually look for, I'm afraid they don't actually look for anything because they, to you, you know, when, when the people processing the applications are looking at you, you they don't see sort of you know, what you've done and you know, uh, what your educational background is and what your work experience is. They just see how you perform in their particular tests. Good to know we've got conflicting advice on the panel. Um, so uh, I also wanted to add uh, on the jobs in Brussels still open, uh, do look out for what's open for next year, find out when, uh, when they open for next year. If you go to apply for something and you see you've just missed the deadline, it was last week, if only I'd thought to look earlier, 
um, usually does happen that way. Then, then check out when they open next year. It might seem like a million years away. It's not. It's only 12 months' time, and there are lots of other things that you could be getting on with in those 12 months. Uh, and you know, if you are lucky enough to get in, and if you do get off of that position, you can always turn it down. Chances are that you'll be applying for a lot of things um, that you don't get uh, before you find something that you do get. Some of you will be lucky and walk straight into something, but there's a, just apply for lots of different things. Find out what's out there and, and you know what, what you might be accepted for. I think it can also be quite difficult if you feel a, a lot of graduates at the moment are being turned down for things. And just remember that it's not because you're not good enough, it's because somebody else has shown something that's even better. Um, and it doesn't mean that, that, that you're not good, it just means that there's one other person, that's all they're looking for, uh, has got one little thing that they've remembered to say on the application form or that they've happened to mention or that they've to put in or they've done and you haven't or something that will give them just that, that upper edge. Um, jobs in Brussels still open more specifically if you look on the Euro Brussels website, there are lots of internships that are available. I did check before coming here, um, and they're always coming up. Also, the Working for MPs uh, website, W4MP, I think it's called. Yeah, it's www.number4mp.org, um, um, www um, and that covers um, UK and EU, actually. And I guess to put in a plug for government, if you go to gov.uk, that's the main portal for British government, and you can find jobs uh, by sort of poking around in there. And there are both internships available and uh, starter entry-level uh, jobs available. Just things like the working in a press office, where you'll get a, a good experience of the sorts of work that they do, or working in communications, um, doing the, the social media, for example, for an organization. You'll get to work with everyone because they'll be putting their message across. They'll need to put it across through you. So those sorts of things. And again, um, if you perform well in the job, people will notice you. And that can often be, it might, it might seem like it's only two days a week and it's only unpaid, but you know, six weeks later, somebody might be saying, oh, you know, do you think you could come in for the rest of the week and think we can find a salary for you? And it, it can easily progress um, if you're interested in something, and it comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, that do something you're interested in because it'll show and it'll at least give you the satisfaction of doing something that, that you care about and, and that you think is sort of worth getting up for and, and, and worth, <laughs> worth your while. Um, okay, have we covered? I think we have covered all those questions. Um, we've got about two minutes left. Is there anyone who is dying to ask a question? No? Well, I think, oh, is all the panel staying on for, for a while afterwards? I think there's wine on offer in case anyone was thinking of leaving. Good, that's everyone staying. Come and talk to us. Importance of networking. Do come and talk to the panel. Put them into your networks. Make sure that so you, can, you can draw on these people who are all very experienced. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you for staying on. And thank you very much to students. And good luck with your careers. <laughs>